All right, um, <clears throat> let's get started. Today's lecture is called ETL in the Tidyverse. So lots of um, things to explain. Um, ETL is Explore, Transform, and Load, and it's sort of the title of the course. Uh, the point being is that ETL is the first step in any project you're going to do. It's to get your data um, into your machine, uh, create, see what issues it has, deal with the issues, create new variables to show features of interest, and uh, then have something you can load into your machine learning. The tidyverse, as I explained uh, previously, but tidyverse is the name uh, given to a, a number of packages written by Hadley Wickham. Um, it's it's a wonderful thing. It's it's a huge huge contribution to the universe of R. Um, they all have common syntax, and they're all you know very good at what they do, and typically very very fast. It's it's a it's made. When I first started working with R, I didn't work with R. I worked with MATLAB in large part because um, dealing with data in R was a huge painful experience and very, very slow. And thanks to packages uh, Hadley has written, that is no longer the case. So um, let's get started. So the goals of this talk is to explain how to get data into R rapidly. You can't do any analysis in R if you can't get the data there. I'm going to teach you SQL. And uh, I'm going to explain to you why teaching you SQL isn't an absurd thing to say or to do. Um, the hardest thing we're going to do is I will talk about group by and summarize, which are incredibly useful uh, things. And I'm going to talk about some things about the tidyverse, things I like and dislike, and they'll, they'll, that'll be just points along the way. Okay, so getting data into R. Uh, Read.csv is, as I say, a steady workhouse. If from ordinary data sets, there's no reason not to use it. It works wonderfully and has lots of freedom. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> issue with read.csv is it was written at a time when a large data set might have been in the hundreds of megabytes. And now with uh, data sets in the gigabytes, it can be slow. And there are better tools when you have really large data sets. And I will talk about those too. Um, in general, you know, when you're doing work on your machine, uh, the, the big limitation is any data you work with in R has to fit in memory. R demands that all its objects be in memory. Uh, so if you have a machine with four gigabytes of memory, that's going to be the real limitation of uh, what you're going to do, not how fast read.csv works. Okay, so one important point is read.csv, it always imports data as a data frame. Data frame you know, we've talked about a lot, but it, it, you can't underestimate how important this development was. The idea that you could create a matrix and it could have different kinds of data. It could have characters, it could have numeric, it could have integer, and you could do different things uh, with, with um, different columns of the data was a really important, useful idea. And um, pandas and um, Python are, are nothing more but um, data frames, uh, you know, trans transferred over to Python. Um, and as I say, it's used read.csv is great unless the uh, data set is high. Uh, and it, so it's versatile. Um, it handles, you know, if you want to import data from the web from a URL, you just use read.csv and you give it the web address. And uh, while it's called CSV for comma separated values, it doesn't handle just comma. It handles anything you use. If you have any file that's you know, delimited by something, you can uh, pretty much tell read.csv what it is, and it'll do it. So um, <clears throat> this is a practical point. I think usually, typically, it's easier to convert. First of all, if you have a large data set that's coming from someplace, it will be a CSV file. But if you have something like somebody sent you an Excel spreadsheet of data, it's typically much easier to convert that to a CSV file by just using Save As in your Excel and then import it rather than to deal with um, importing Excel files. Though, again, due to the Hadleyverse, he does have packages for importing uh, data from uh, Excel, and they're not bad. Um, but it, it's if you're doing read.csv, 95% of the time it's fine. Um, there's a point. There's also read.csv2 and read.table. And you may say, well, why do this? 
why read.csv and not read.table? And the answer is these are all essentially the same function. They only differ in what defaults. You'll, unless you're in Europe, not likely to use read.csv2 because it only differs from read.csv in that I think it, um, in, in Europe, a lot of places where in America we use commas, they use periods, and it sets the default to period, not comma. Um, so let's look at the, some of the major settings of that. Excuse me. I just, oops. Let me um, reload this. All right, let's just go on for here. I thought I had uh, created a different slide with something. Uh, so some of the important defaults are um, header, which says whether the first line is the column names, the separator, which you know you put in uh, quotation marks, and the default is again comma, but that you can make anything you want. So the separator is how your data is delimited. Fill equals true. That's a default. It means it fills in the missing rows of data with NAs rather than getting rid of them. Uh, this is the one that's annoying to most people. Strings as factors equals true. So what this means if you have a character string, um, <clears throat> say you know red, blue, green, or a zip code, just as, or even numbers that are, you know, as characters. The default is to import them as factors, not as characters. And most of the time, you want for one reason or other them to be characters. Uh, call names is another one. Uh, it's less important, you, but it, you can specify the column names for your uh, data frame. And I, but I don't like to do that in read.csv for clarity of what you're. You have to assume that whatever you're doing, somebody else at some point is going to see it. And if the column names are hidden in a read.csv, it's going to be a lot harder to find. So I like to, if I want to change column names or give my uh, data frame column names, do it separately. I will import the data set, and then I'll have column names of data set equals, and then it's very clear what's going on. So as I said, I prefer to change the column names in the script. Are there any questions so far? Uh, all right. Doesn't seem to be. In that case, quiz one, true or false? And again, uh, I'm going to have you just answer it on the chat because that way I can see what's going on. I can report it to you, but this stays up there. Uh, it's true or false, read.csv is the only way to import data. Okay, false is winning 2 nothing, 4 nothing, 5 nothing, just a little bit more. All right, as I just said, it's not the only way. There's three ways in the base R package is read.csv, read.csv2, and read.table. And there's also uh, other methods uh, in the tidyverse and in data table. Final false. All right, and uh, so let's move on. Quiz two, a little bit harder. Which is true? Read.csv only imports files separated by a comma. Read.csv imports data as matrices. Read.csv is commonly used because it is fast. Or read.csv will import data from the web. And uh, I think I've addressed all these points, so uh, what, which one of these statements is true? I have one for number two. I have two for number two. I'm going to give you guys a hint. I'm tricking you so far. I have one for number four. I have two for number four. It's Two all for two and four. Someone want to break the tie? We have four. So four wins. And four is correct. It's, it's a bit of a trick. Read.csv imports data as data frames. Now, data frames are kinds of matrices, but they're, but they're not matrices. In other words, if, if you, they, they behave differently. So, and, and data frames are more versatile in particular. 
So in particular matrices, I, I will explain all the answers. Um, but the correct answer is um, going to be four. But it's not two, it imports them as data frames, not matrices. Data frames are a larger, more versatile character, class of uh, things. Read.csv only imports files separated by a comma. It's by default it's a comma, as somebody is noting, but it will do any delimiter. So you can even have just blank space, but most common delimiters, colon, semicolon, in fact, you may recall when we imported the weather data set about the temperatures and whatnot in El Porto, if you go back and look, you'll see that that was separated by a semicolon. And we just had to say read.csv, and we gave it whatever the address was, and then you had to say sep equals colon. So let me just, so read.csv foo. Let me see, do I have something in here? Uh, I see something called top flights. Well, no, these are all data frames, I can't. But if, if read.csv, some object, comma, separator equals would work as long as the separator is the colon. All right. Uh, so let me just check. I see we have some chat comments. I want to respond to them. scroll down to where they are. So why not one is because one, the default is that it assumes it's a, a colon, a comma, but you can make it any separator, as somebody uh, noted. Uh, somebody says that read some feet can also import from a particular directory, so option four is not correct. Um, I didn't say read.csv only will import data from the web. That is certainly not true, but it will import data from the web. Usually we, imp we have the data on our machine and you'll just give um, read.csv the location in a particular directory of your data set. And I think we'll, have an, we'll see an example of that later on in the presentation. But as long as I say read.csv, I didn't say only will import data from the web, that would be false. It certainly does import data from your hard drive or wherever, but it certainly will. So I, I think I'm, I'm satisfied that four is right. Okay. Any other? Uh, all right. I'm just going ahead. Okay. So that's read.csv. So the main drawback, no one would ever do anything except use read.csv except for the advent of really large data sets because it tends to be slower than other things. And two major alternatives is the reader package in the tidyverse and the fread, fast read function in the data.table package. Uh, so a, a quick aside on the tidyverse, I, you've heard me talk about it a lot and I, I think I've said all this. It's a set of packages, so they're all compatible with each other. They all use the same sort of syntax. They all use the same sort of language. They, they all work with each other seamlessly. And they tend to be pretty fast because what, what he's done is, is really under the hood what's being called as C or C++. So the, it tends to be very fast. Incidentally, you know, CRAN, which is the repository of our packages, keeps a list of which packages are the most popular to download. And recent years, the most popular um, package to download is something called RCPP, which is an interface from R into C++. And the truth is almost no one, you know, downloads it directly because very few people write C++ code. But many major packages, any package doing anything fast, requires you to download RCPP because they use the interfaces and all the really complicated stuff is executed in C++, which is orders of magnitude faster than, um, you know, R. Incidentally, Python does the same thing. I mean, Python, I believe, is written in C and, and all the, the fast packages that are doing complicated, you know, linear math, you know, just make calls to uh, C++ packages. Okay, so that's the good. What's the bad? He has this thing. He doesn't like data frames. Okay. Um, I was asked a question before we go. Let me answer that. 
is the amount of data R can handle limited by physical memory on the machine, or is it a predefined limit? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's defined by the amount of memory on the machine. I don't think a priori there's a size limit to the size of an R object. If there is, it's certainly the case that it's larger than um, any data set people use in any context currently, which is to say that, you know, people load instances of R and, you know, these Google Cloud machines and Amazon or Microsoft machines, and, you know, you can, um, R can address literally terabytes of um, memory. So for all practical purposes, the answer is that it's limited by the amount of memory in your machine. If you're talking about a machine in my house or your house, then it is absolutely the case. It, I mean, I've run R on machines with 64 gigabytes of RAM installed, and it just doesn't say anything. So essentially, it's the size of the machine. Okay, so the bad about this is Tibbles, and we'll hear more about him later. He doesn't like data frames. He has this um, thing called Tibbles, and I understand his quibbles with data frames, but I, I think I find Tibbles more annoying uh, than uh, useful. I'll show you why later. He loves snake case. <laughs> this is a very personal thing. Uh, so snake case is when you have complex names, you separate them by an underscore. Uh, camel case is when you separate uh, words by making capital letters in the middle. So, and dot notation he doesn't like to. Pipes is a, another creation of his that he loves that I think are uh, terrible. Is anyone besides me having issues? Is anyone having issues besides Pratik on uh, audio? Uh, I'm. Uh, Manish is asking that I am recording the session. I'm 99% sure I am. Let me triple check. Uh, yes, I'm recording. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, audio issues that. So tibbles are like data frames. So in the tidyverse, when you, you when you use his functions, a lot of the times the output is a tibble, not a data frame. Uh, they, for the most part, they are the same thing. Uh, they they differ a little. There's two major things ways which tibbles differ from data frames. Uh, the good way is if you use logical indexing on a tibble, you get another tibble. Usually when you do logical indexing on a data frame, you get another data frame. But if you, certain kinds of indexing, I believe if you just take a, a particular column, it no longer is a data frame. It becomes just whatever it is, a matrix, a vector. Uh, so somebody's saying they're not getting audio. Uh, but it's only one person. So I, I don't know what to say or do. Everyone else seems to be hearing me. So the problem is uh, at the uh, listener's end. I can only suggest turning on and off your machine. I'm sorry, I, I just don't know what to do. Uh, pipes is a way of giving multiple commands at once. So I'll talk more about pipes uh, later on when I'll show you. And as I said, tibbles are like data frames. I'm not a fan of them. Other people like them, obviously. OK, uh, so as I said, tibbles are basically data frames. And this is what I said. They display differently. That's the thing I, I, I really find annoying. Tibbles will always only show as much data <clears throat> as uh, can conveniently fit on sort of one obvious chunk of the screen. So if you have a lot of columns and you want to, you know, like it'll only show the first five or six or whatever columns it will fit. And if you actually want to look at column eight, it, it, it just won't let you. Okay, so um, if you want to use, one way to do it is, of course, you can, once you've installed the library, the tidyverse, the library for, the library tidyverse will install all the packages. And this is showing you some of them. ggplot is a tidy, so I haven't even mentioned ggplot. ggplot is a fantastic tool. I mean, it, it allows with, you know, a little bit of work to do the most amazing graphics. I mean, just on the little bit I've taught you, I think you're basically, except for possible zooming in graphs, able to do anything Tableau can do. Uh, tidier, uh, we won't discuss that here. Uh, it's a package to do with how you manipulate data. Reader, I mentioned, that's for importing data. Pure or per, I won't mention, that's a way for dealing with uh, manipulate, 
doing things to multiple data frames. And DeepWire, we're going to talk about later. It's uh, the equivalent of SQL. Okay. Um, so here I just, to show you, if I, I create this data frame, it's 1 to 10,000. If I, um, and this is going to go on for quite a while, if I just say print out the data frame, it does so. Oh, God, I see the person who is having issues is no longer having them. But if I, um, so if I use the as underscore tibble, which since the tibble package is loaded, will create um, data. This is a tibble. Oops, and I wrote class data frame, but I did mean class tibble. No, I did. And then you see, you can see when, when it's a tibble, tibble as in table. It creates, it says it's one of these three things. So what this means in particular, and this is a useful thing, is that anything that you can do to a data frame, you can do to a tibble. But you can see it automatically, when you print it, it doesn't print out the whole thing. It just stops after 10 uh, rows and says, with more rows. And if you had columns, it would stop after as many columns it would fit this phase and just say there's more columns. Uh, and so if you really wanted to see something, you wouldn't do this. Okay. So, and I've discussed Reader previously, and um, as I said, uh, Reader is their uh, package for importing data, and I wrote, but the data table package is currently the de facto standard if you want to have fast loading of data, and all you do is, you, you know, you go to our studio and you start typing in data table, and at some point it'll give it to you, and it'll, you can install that package very simply. And it's a package, it's not just for loading data, it's a package for manipulating data. So just and so it also serves as a version of something like DeepWire, a way for saying, I give me all the rows of my matrix that have some property. Give me all the columns that whose name begin with this. But it uses a, a different syntax than R or SQL or DeepWire for indexing. And um, <clears throat> Many people, myself included, find the syntax uh, hard. So unless, so I, I will use data table for importing, but I, I almost never use it for, uh, unless I have absolutely huge objects where it'll take minutes to perform an impulation, I just find the syntax um, hard to remember, hard to do, and hard to um, use. And it creates classes of the, of the um, objects of the class data table. So as I said, you use it because it's fast. If you, I, I just, uh, on, at work the other day, I was loading into my machine a file that was six gigabytes. And with, uh, with uh, the fread, uh, it took about 30 seconds. Six gigabytes downloaded, you know, installed in R in about 30 seconds. Um, so it's really fast. Another nice thing about the fread or fast read or freed is it automatically figures out the classes of columns and does all the bookkeeping. So all you have to do, um, and I, I, have, I mentioned the syntax I hate, is if you do F read my data, you don't have to say, you know, separate equals, you don't have to say strings as factors equals true or false. It goes through, looks at your data, and does produce, almost without fail, the correct type of column that the data was priorly prior to that. So fread is something you should know about. If you ever are importing really large data sets, and you know, particularly if it's something you have to do time and time again, remember freed. It'll do it. So fastest way to import data creates data table objects. You must convert to data frames or learn the data.table syntax. So in other words, the object you get from a freed is not a, is not a data frame. And unless you physically convert it to a data frame, you will, when you do try and use indexing, because data tables index in a different way, you'll get really bad results. So um, this is just example, library data table. This warning, of course, is just saying that it's not built under the current version of R, which is OK. Um, this is something that occasionally you have to look out for, and this lecture won't be. Um, but when R doesn't enforce uh, that, you know, functions have unique names. So you do have the situation where uh, different packages can use the same names for functions, but they 
operate differently. So th what this is telling you is dplyr was loaded first, and it had functions called between first and last, and that um, <clears throat> data.table is taking those over those functions and uh, now calling using their versions of those functions. Um, so this is something you, you, you may have to watch out for. I did see an example of a um, project where a student couldn't understand why you know, it wasn't outputting the right thing, and the answer was he'd imported two packages that had the same function name, and he was using the function from the first package, and the second package was uh, actually the one that was calling the function because it was called last. So this is just a practical thing to be aware of. But here I just said C equals, and you see, this is the syntax. Uh, credit set uh, is just a data set I have of, uh, you know, credit worthiness of uh, some, it's a very famous data set of 2,000 Germans and some characteristics and whether or not they defaulted on a 10-year loan. And you see the class of, of, when I use C, it's not a data frame, it's data table in a data frame, which means uh, the things that data table does, it's going to do differently than for a data frame. Uh, so, and as I said, you know, so as you can see, like things like summary or dimension, which, you know, are just unique to the, the base package, it, it, it handles just perfectly. So it has client ID, income, age, loan, and I just gave you the first four columns. Um, so, as a, so just to emphasize one more time, if you use um, fread, unless you're going to use the data.table syntax throughout, when, you know, I, I don't, after you um, create it, you should change it to a data frame with just the data frame command. All right, so the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of uh, data manipulation in SQL, and this we're going to spend much more time on, is dplyr. The dplyr is uh, the package in the um, Hadleyverse for um, manipulating data, and it's very nice. I think the syntax is very straightforward, simple. People like it. I like it. It's very similar to SQL, and which is, I think once you feel comfortable with this, you can tell people you know SQL. Uh, it's, you know, slightly, slightly different, but you really do know SQL, and, and it's fast. It's very fast. It's basically written in C++. Um, before we start talking more about this, are there any questions um, so far? I'm going to take a sip of coffee while you decide if you want to ask me anything. <clears throat> All right, so, you know, I have to be honest, I had mixed feelings about the ordering of this class, and I decided it, was, it would probably be a little better and more fun to, you know, first do some statistics and then go back to dplyr. But there's no doubt that some of the things we did with some of the data sets would have been um, easier to do had we had dplyr in our back pocket. So what are the basic operations one can do with a, a tool like dplyr? You can... Um, pick specific rows according to a criteria. You can say I want certain columns according to a criteria. Now typically rows are examples. The columns are different data types. So you typically when you pick rows, you pick it on, you know, criteria. All the rows that have uh, no negative numbers. All the rows that have red in it. And columns are generally, they have names and you want columns you want specific column names. But the other thing you can do is you can create new columns. And um, the last and important thing is you can summarize data by some type. So for example, suppose you had a, a, a list of customers and, and information about their purchases. And you had people who bought them in, you know, and you had five stores and online. So you'd have the type of which, you know, store one, store two, through store five and online. And you could group by the different types and say, um, not just pull out all the ones whose type was they bought in store three, but you could compute statistics and information about that, you know, and you could look and see, did people who bought in store three spend more on average than people who bought in store one? Or, um, you know, you could group by type, by type of merchandise they bought, you know, did they buy, you know, building materials, did they buy tools, and you could sort all that out. So it's very useful, and I will explain that much more in a bit. All right. So, uh, as I said, 
with rows, you typically want to get information about certain properties. And the ways you do that is what's with Boolean algebra. So basically, you want to say all the rows that satisfy, if you have one condition, it just is what it is. But if you have one more than one condition, you'd have to use the Boolean algebras and or or not. So you could say, show me all the rows which satisfy condition one and condition two. So that would be, show me all the rows that were, um, they bought in store two and they bought building materials. You could do that with uh, the and. Or you could show me all the people who bought in store two or bought in store one or bought building materials. And not you, is exactly that, would be the opposite. So show me all the people who bought building materials and not from store one. And the symbols for them are and, the straight line, and exclamation point. So and means and, the straight up and down line means or, and exclamation point is not. And from logicals, we add the double equal sign, which is an equality. It says that the object on the left is the same as the object on the right, not make the object on the left equal to the object on the right. And the exclamation point equal means not equal. So the objects on the left that are not equal to the objects on the right. And for numbers, you can also add um, inequalities, less than, less than or equal, greater than, and greater than and equal. So those are the Booleans. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples, and if you have questions after that, I'll take them. So the other thing is that there's this slash n. So n means one of a number of conditions. So let me example this. So if I say x satisfies condition 1 or condition 2 up to or condition n, I'm looking for the x that satisfies any of these. X customers who bought in store one and in store two or in store two or in store four. Let's say those three things. But it's simple. I could write x slash n, the union of these conditions. This would mean x that was in one of these conditions. So you could write this, you know, um, it's typically simple to write. So for example, if I had, you know, go back to your, your midterm, and I'm, this is not quite I'm asked to explain Boolean operators later, but let me do that now. I'm sorry, wrong way. Boolean operators are, exa are exactly these three things, and, or, or not. If you have a bunch of things, and the technical mathematical term is sets, or subsets, or subsets of the power set, you can do combinations with sets. You can look for the elements that are in, if I have two sets A and B, I can look for the elements that are in A and B. I can look for the elements that are in A or B, and I can look for the elements that are not in A or not in B. And so anything you can do with and, or, or not is called a Boolean operation. The Boolean algebra is, the, you know, is, is just a fancy way of saying that. It's anything for which you can make the sense of they're in both of them, they're in one of them, or they're not in them. And that's, what, and that's all I mean by Boolean algebra, and that's... You know, it's a fancy word, but, I mean, it's kind of unavoidable. I believe the man's name was George Boole, but it certainly was Boole who invented this, and it was, you know, it's just a very useful idea. And once you abstract it, you know, it's very, very powerful. I don't claim it's easy. I claim it's hard. I think the only way you get good at this is by practice. So here's something that is absolutely true. If you have a thorough understanding of Boolean algebra, if you understand how to use and, or, and not to make really complex and interesting commands on your data set, you are a SQL master. The heart of SQL is understanding how to use these operations in conjunction with each other to um, make commands that will pull specific pieces of data from a data set. So it's very easy on some level to say I understand it, but to get good at it and useful at it is just, it's just a question of practice. So don't be surprised or upset if you find this complicated and hard and you have to think three or four times before you convince yourself that you wrote down what you think. That's the nature of the game. It's just like people in Linux. The experts at Linux, you know, are people who really understand something called grep, get representation. And there's a few forms of it. And again, I, you know, if I 
care to, and I don't, and you don't want me to, but if I care to explain grep in 10, 15 minutes, I could explain the basis of it. Yet people work in Linux for 10 years, and then they say, okay, I finally got it. I understand the ins and out. I know how to use it efficiently now. And, and that's the same thing with this. So Boolean algebra just means using and or a not. I hope that answers the question. So to, to, I, I think I was explaining, so we could use the in operator. And when you see this in R, and there are other cop rays besides in, when you, when you see this, what it means is you have to have something to the left of it and something to apply to something to the right of it. So as I said, X, X satisfies condition one or condition two or blast condition, the same as X is in, Condition one, condition two, up to the last condition. So, for example, if I have which wind, which columns of my, which rows in my matrix have wind direction equal, and you see the double equal sign, east northeast, or wind direction to east southeast, or wind direction equal to east, is the same thing as saying wind direction in C of east northeast, east southeast, east. Um, somebody asked me this. I'll point out. I've just not written these. As this was written, this would be some sort of R object. If you wanted, you know, if you had a character, you would have to explicitly say so by um, putting uh, things. So it's going to just give me an error. But R will understand that as the character east northeast. If I type east northeast, it's going to say that's an object, and I don't know what it is. So that's a small point, but for the sake of this. Illustrating it, there was I didn't put in parentheses. But if you were, had the actual wind directions, which were characters, you'd have to put east northeast in uh, quotations. All right. Any questions on that? Oops. All right. Next quiz. So if I say wind is in either north and south and and wind is in east or west, which wind directions am I getting? Am I getting all four directions? Am I getting no directions? Or am I getting wind that's in one of them but not the other? All right. So that's the question. If I say wind in C of NS and wind in C of East W in a hint hint, north and south is completely different from east and west, which will I get? Uh, two is winning. Let me see. I didn't have my chat maximized. It's three nothing for two. Four nothing, five nothing for two. Um, five people have answered the previous quizzes. I'm going to declare this closed. The correct answer is empty. The and sign means I want winds that are in, either in the north and the south and winds that are only in the east and the west. These two sets of subs are distinct from each other. So when I say it's in this set and in this set, there is nothing in both sets. Okay, so it's empty. It wouldn't be four directions if I had wind in C of North S or wind in C of EW, that would be all four directions. And um, wind in either but not both is, is, is again, just wrong. All right? And I think we had someone else. Yeah, so everyone got that one right. Great. Okay, so... Um, the main thing to remember with dplyr is you filter rows and you select columns. So filtering is the command uh, to pick out certain rows. Select is for columns. Mutate is the command to create new columns, and you can do that by any one of a number of things, arithmetic, logical, whatever you want. If, as long as it creates a new column of the same size, you can use that. And transmute creates a new column, but gets rid of the old column that was you know, previously. So when might you want to use transmute? Suppose you have, you know, scores and you want, you really don't interest in the scores, you're just interested in, in the, the z-scores, the scale. 
So you might want to scale your scores, and, and you don't really care about the old scores, so then you would use transmute. If you have a column, and for some reason you're interested in the log of it, you probably still are interested in the data in the column. So you use mutate to create a new column that contained the log of your previous data. And if you decided you only wanted the log and you didn't want the real one, you'd transmute. So um, columns, as I said, usually columns are names of things, and you know we don't manipulate columns. Uh, so usually uh, when you, you, you select columns by either name or uh, column numbers, and dplyr does that. dplyr has a lot of um, commands for selecting columns. I, I really find them useful. Unless you had huge numbers of columns, uh, you could do that. And, and again, this would get into this whole grep business, which I consider a little off the beaten path. For you know any data set, a reasonable number of columns, you can just use um, either the numbers or the names, and that'll work. Okay, so let's um, do an example. Uh, this is all from Chapter 3 of R for Data Science. It's not quite the same thing he did. There's a few things that are different. Uh, one or two things he, I did he didn't do, and there's certainly a lot of things in there that I didn't do. And remember, if you didn't buy the book, the book is available online. So you can look at all this stuff. If you Google online R for Data Science, you'll find it. Um, and it's a wonderful book. So we're going to use dplyr. In fact, it was already lo lo loaded, but it's always a good idea to do this. And the data we're going to use is called NYC Flights 13. It's all the flights from uh, New York City in the year 2013. And um, we can see, since it was loaded, it's a package created by Hadley. It's um, what he calls a tibble, as these three classes. And uh, whenever you get a data set, the first thing you should do is take a quick look and see what's in it. And summary will do that. And we see it's year. The year is all 2013. Months, not surprisingly, go from 1 to 12. The days, now this is interesting, the days go from 1 to 31. This tells you that it gives you the day of the month, not just the day of the year. So, you know, day 32 would be month 2, day 1. Departure time, scheduled departure time, delay, arrival time, scheduled arrival time, arrival delay, the carrier, uh, the flight, and the tail number of the plane. No, oh, that's not it. And then the origin, where it came from, where destination where it went to, how long it was in the air, how far did it travel, and um, the hour and minute of the flight. Okay, so that's a lot of information in there. And if I go ahead of flights, this is what I don't like about table. It says it's a six by head of flights is a six by nineteen. It shows the first six rows, but rather than showing all the columns, it says, well, it's convenient for me to print out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on your screen. So I'll I'll do that and just tell you there's twelve more variables. Now the good news is. It gives you some information. It gives you the names and it tells you what they are. So schedule arrival time. Int is an integer. Arrival delay is a double, so that could be it can have decimals and so on and so forth. And finally, it has time hour. It tells you that's a date time class. So it does give you that information. But if you were interested in looking at the head of uh, column 19, uh, you would be sort of out of luck. Now, um, names. We kind of saw that from the table, but here it gives you the names. All right, so the first thing I want to do is filter flights for the first month. So I just to give you an example of filtering, I want to pull out all um, the flights that occurred in January. Uh, and I wrote oops, and I didn't execute it. I, and the reason I didn't execute it is as follows. If we go to R, and I type in C equal filter. So I want to filter. I want to filter flights. And then I want month equal one. So the first month, it throws an error. And when you're creating um, documents with R markdown, which is what I'm doing, when it throws an error, it just stops executing and says, go fix your error in R. We won't let you print this. But had you done that, you would see error month not, must not be named. Do you need equals? And the answer is yes, I do. Oh, right. 
this would say show me flight filter flights and then I'm saying all the months are equal to one I don't want that I want the months which are one and so um, well before we do the quiz so this fails because I'm not telling it I want the months that are one remember that's a double equal sign and having given you that huge hint why did the command fail and my first choice is the month should be January not one the second choice is the month should be January as a character and choice three is computers get cranky and choice four is the correct command is the double equal sign so one two three everyone's voting for number four it's, it's number four by a landslide and of course that's right uh, the months remember um, when we if you look at months where is it oh, it's up here they go from 1 to 12 so the months are given by numbers but when I said month equal one I weren't saying show me the months that are have the value one I was saying month I'm giving it a command month equals one so it is the correct command is double equal um, I tend to make this mistake at least once a day on a day where I'm doing a lot of uh, SQL like stuff but once you know this is the error it'll be at least very quick to correct okay so and, and then I might say I can filter it I want to filter flights and I want the month to be the first month and the day to be the third day ah and look what it says it says warning package bind RCPP was built and it's just again it's just a harmless warning it just says it wasn't built on the current version but it's okay it went perfectly well and this RCPP is the call to C++ and it is telling you that filter under the hood is working in C++ so it will be very class fast and so I've just given my um the, what I've done a name C I use that a lot I reuse it a lot so C will be the data frame from flights but it'll consist of only flights in month one and day three and you see what it does it says is a tibble six by nineteen it only shows the first um, six rows and again it only shows the first uh, twelve and there are times when that might be annoying and that's because it's a class and in fact we see um, C has 914 rows and 19 uh, columns. Now, why did it work for dimension? Because there is no function of class tibble called dimension. So when it sees dimension, it, it knows you must mean um, the base R function dimension. And it says, well, there's a debate data frame too. So as a data frame, I can get its dimension. Okay. And uh, so here's another thing. Uh, the year is always going to be one. The month is always, the day is always going to be three in this data frame. I don't need those columns; they're always fixed, so I can remove them and I can use the select command. So I okay, can select from C the columns and month day, to, with and with a minus sign. So that means select from C all the columns except month and day. Okay, and you see when I do that, it's just gone year and now departure time. Um, so it does that the other thing I, I want to point out to you is and this is just you know something just it's a fact it doesn't want to see a month and day with parentheses like they might be over here it just wants to remove you just tell it month and day so select from C minus C combination month and day means select from C all the columns that are not month or day anyone so all the rest of the columns and look we now have 17 columns Okay, so that's an example of using select. Okay, so um, how do you convert to a table to a pure data frame? I'll, I'll be glad to say it, and I, I, I do have that written down, and so I'll, you'll see it in writing later. But to turn something into a data frame, the standard command is data.frame. So if I use data.frame, of foo whatever foo is if it can be turned into a data frame it will do that of course 
and there's nothing called foo, so it's just going to throw an error. And the other time is there's something called as dot data frame, and that's when something can be it's not naturally a data frame, but it can be coerced. But these are subtle points of um, programming. But the way you do it is by telling R make it a data frame. Okay, so filter with logicals. So filter members get rid of rows. So um, three carriers are United Airlines, American Airlines, and DL is Delta. I could tell, um, create a thing and say, I just want to see from C uh, the ones where the carriers United Airlines or the carriers American Airlines or the car carriers Delta. So this will give me a new data frame, which I'm calling C1, which will be all the flights, on, it was January, month one, day three, which were done by United, American, or DL. And we can check with the logicals, I could filter C, and I just want the carriers that are in the combination of United Airlines, Delta, or American. It doesn't matter the order. And so I could create a second frame, and we can check that these give you identical objects by using the identical function, and you see it says it's true. So this is an example. I mean, I think it's just easier uh, to write out carrier in this. I think it also makes it clearer what you're doing. So I think it's shorter and um, clearer to use the in function. And so this is an example of how you would use it. Okay, uh, RM, you may recall, means remove. It means get rid of these. And, and if you're doing a lot of work, using RM to clear out things you're not using is a good idea, not just for memory-saving purposes, but you'll be surprised how often that something you think is something really is something else because you didn't change it. Uh, so C1, uh, select flight C of 2, 4. So this one I'm telling select from flights columns 2, 3, and 4, which happen to be named month. Uh, day and departure time. And uh, C2 is select from flights the combination, and you see, as I said, you don't put uh, quotations, but month, day, and uh, these create identical objects. So this is just two different ways to use select, which, now, if you had, I, 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 you know, as long as you understand, the only problem with doing something like this is if things change. If it's a data set you're manipulating, you're much better off taking the time to write out the columns you want to select so that if columns get moved around, you don't take the wrong columns in the future. And script sets can be an issue. Um, the other two functions I want to talk about in the basic uh, dplyr package is arrange and mutate. So arrange is um, dplyr's version of sort. It sorts or arranges uh, your rows in an order based on criteria you tell it. Mutate, as I said, is um, to add new columns, and arrange works just like it sounds, and arranges uh, ascending order, and if you want descending order, you just use the descend function around, and I'll show you this in a, just a second. So if I want to arrange flights by schedule departure time, I just say arrange that, and, and it, of course it's just going to um, do that, and, and, and you could see um, these are all increasing. And if I say arrange flights descending scheduled departure time, it's now going to start with the top, the highest ones, and descend down. So that that's a simple use of uh, arrange. You can you can sort on any column. I think I, I, just in case I didn't write this down, you can descend sort on more than one column. You could uh, you know um, sort on scheduled departure time and then sort on arrival time. You know, so for a given depart, if you have two all these flights with the same uh, departure time, it would then put the arrival times in the correct order. It would change the rows that way. So yes, arrange can be done on more than one column. So if I can descend on scheduled departure time and then on departure delay, uh, we can see it's going to start with the highest departure times, and then it's going to this dependence ray. It's going to go from um, it's going to sort within the given departure time, res further sort the uh, rows so that they have to do with departure delay. Okay, so this is great when you want to look at data, and and this can have real uses. If you want to find, you know, what are the worst or the best flights for some criteria, you can use arrange to find that. There's lots of times when you're going to want to arrange data. 
Mutate, as I said, adds a new column, transmute replace columns, and all arithmetic works. So here's an example. If I want to say, you know, for uh, uh, flights, uh, you know, what's just the average delay, this is kind of a, not such a great usage, but I'm going to create an average delay. There's a reason why I use this. This will become more interesting when we go to group by in a minute. Uh, but I can just uh, uh, create a new column called average delay. Here it is, and it's the mean of the departure delay. Now, I want to point out two things. I have na.rm equals true. Why? Because there are NAs in this data set, and if I don't do that, it will just say that the mean is always NA, because once you have an NA in your data set, the result of any arithmetic operation is NA. Because NA means specifically don't know. could be anything. So if you add 7 to something you don't know, you still don't know what you got. And finally, so you could see it, I only took columns 1 through 4 and 19 and 20. 19 was the last regular column in the FITES data set, and 20 is the column it added. Because I used mutate, it added a new column. And then you can see it had so many more rows. And by the way, so this data set is about 300. 50,000 rows, it takes 10, 20 seconds to load, I don't know, not long, and all these, you know, things I did with it are, are essentially instantaneous. Uh, just, let me give you an example. Uh, this is the, this is the, 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 the markdown file that creates some um, thing, if, if I just execute that line, it's executed. So 350,000 rows, I created that, and it just took under a second. So it's, it's very fast. Okay. So as I said, I, I find this feature that dplyr will create tibbles rather than keep data frames as data frames annoying. Um, so if you need your data frame, it's very simple. And now you can see the answer to the question, how do you turn something into a data frame? The command is data.frame. So I add C, which was we saw was this um, tibble, and I want it to be, um, I now want it to be uh, a data frame. I say C is just data frame of C, and now the class of C is just a data frame. So that's how you do it. And uh, now when I um, so give it the head command, it will print, maybe not here, but on, on the screen. Let's see. Head C. Oh no! So now it's a tibble again. It's something different. So, um, gosh, I'm looking for something with a lot of variables. I don't. But um, <laughs> feel free to print this out on uh, your uh, computer. Once it's a data frame, if it has multiple columns, it'll it'll do like this. It'll just print all the columns. Rather than doing the first six, it'll print however many columns you have, and it'll just range them one under, one under another. And that's because now C is a data frame. All right, so we've talked a little bit about NAs, and, I, and, and we've talked about them in various classes, but um, when you have data, when you first get it, finding out about what your situation is with NAs and how you're going to deal with them is an issue. As I pointed out, one problem is, is many functions, you know, for simple functions like mean or standard deviation, you, there's a command that says, you know, just ignore NAs and, you know, compute on the real data. But any more complicated function won't. And so how, how to deal with NAs is an issue. And uh, summary will show whether you have them or not. Uh, but you need other functions to uh, deal, finding their exact position, deal with them. And, and I, I just can't emphasize this enough, but I'll try to, and by saying, how you deal with NAs is a function of the situation. Sometimes NAs represent valuable, legitimate information. And sometimes, you know, and you need to keep them in your data set for integrity. Other times you maybe feel happy, like I have 300,000 observations and 20 NAs, I'll use some reasonable procedure to fill them in or I'll ignore them and that will be okay. But if I have 
20 observations and 12 of them have NAs and then I just remove them and I say, well, this is my finding for this data set, you really haven't because you've thrown out the majority of the data set. So how you're going to deal with NAs is going to, I can't, there is no rule, except there, the only rule is there is no rule. Okay, um, quick stop. A any questions before I move on? Uh, anything? No? I'll take a sip of coffee. I'll move on. Okay, so um, how do you find NAs? That's um, okay. NA is, it just mean is, is an R notation for we don't know what it is. There is no data. So I, you know, it 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 really just means data is missing. Okay, so if you have NAs can exist anywhere. They can exist in numeric data sets. They can exist in character data sets. Logical. It just means we have no information. It's ours shorthand for I don't know what to do. So as a result, if you don't know what to do because I mean I don't have data, when you want to apply any kind of operation to that, the result is always going to be NA because if you start with I don't know what I have and you do anything to it, you still don't know what you have. All right? So um, NA just means your data set has missing data and where it is can be found by is.na. Is.na is exactly that. It tells you, it gives you a logical of all the elements of your data set and it tells you which are um, NAs and which aren't. It just returns a one zero. So for example, if I had my famous data set foo, is.na of foo will look at every element of foo and return either a true for if it is an NA or a false if it isn't. And remember, true is one and false is zero. So when you sum that, it'll sum all the trues and tell you how many trues you have. So sum is n dot na of foo will tell you how many nas you have. So for example, if you want to replace it with zero, if you look at foo and then you have is dot na of foo, that gives you that's saying, I'm gonna that says look at all the indexes where you have an na, and this is going to replace them with zero. And now I do mean equal. So this is a very nice trick for if, for example, you know, and there are times when NA can be replaced by a zero harmlessly. And if you do that, this is a good thing. So this is a great example of logical indexing. So I'm looking at foo. This says, give me all the spots where foo is not a number. And then I'm saying replace them all with zero. I have an example in a second. But in data, zero may be there too. Yes. As I said, what you do with NAs very much varies from situation to situation. I'm just saying specifically in a situation where, as far as you're concerned, zero is equivalent to NA, you could replace it with zero. There may be times when you want to replace NA, but you want to replace it with something else. For example, you might want to replace it with the mean of all the other values. So, all right. Uh, let me go here. Let, let, let me do another simple example. So suppose um, NA is replaced only by zero by some, NA can be anything. We'll see that in a second. So what, and you actually you'll see it now. So suppose foo is, I create foo and I know it's one, two, three, and NA. All right. So if I look at foo, it's one, two, three. If I ask for the mean of foo, I'm going to get NA. It doesn't know what the mean of that is, because this could be anything. This, this fourth thing could be a thousand, it could be zero, it could be minus one, it doesn't know what it is. I could say, give me the mean of foo, and as I say, na dot rm, remember, that means na dot remove equals true. That means remove all the nas and then calculate it, so I'm going to get the mean of one, two, and three, which better be two. Okay? So if I look at is dot na of foo, it should return four. It should return uh, false, 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 four. I mean, false, 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 true. And if I, oops, comma, home. So if I sum these, the sum of false is zero and a true is one, I'm going to get one, which tells me there's one NA. Now, the one thing I could do is I could say foo of 
is dot n a of foo equals, and maybe I don't want zero. Maybe I just want to say, well, I'm going to assume it's on average. I could then say it, the foo of that is equal to the mean of um, foo, and then, of course, I better have n a dot remove equals true. And so the left-hand side, this is going to be the mean of the other three. We know that's two. And so now what this is going to do is it says where, wherever foo is n a, which is the fourth spot, replace it by the, the mean value. And now if I look at foo, you see the fourth place instead of n a, I have two. So absolutely doesn't have to replace it with zero. What you replace it with is a function of um, your common sense knowledge of uh, what, 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 what's reasonable to do. Okay? So that, that, as I said, going back, here we go. How you deal with NAs is very much depends on the situation. There is no rule that says NA should be mean, should be median, it should be anything. Uh, the other thing that's very useful is a function called complete dot cases. Complete dot cases returns an index of all rows without missing values. So if I have a data set foo and it, it, let's say it was a matrix, if I looked at foo of complete dot cases of foo comma, and you see the comma means I want, the, I have this row index, and it's just going to give me the indices where there's no missing data, and that will return only the rows with no missing data. That's a very nice convenient trick for getting rid of NAs if you want to get rid of them. Okay, so here's let's have a quiz on that. So which statement is correct? Is dot NA replaces NA with zero? Let me get this up so I can see it when you start responding. Is dot NA counts how many NAs are in a document? Is dot NA returns a lock, logical vector of where NAs are located? In other words, gives you true for the ones that are NAs and false. Is dot NA removes all NAs from a data frame? All right. So any uh, thing? I have a couple of votes for uh, three. Three votes for three. All right, three it is. It does. It it, it returns a logical vector of where the NAs are located. And I, I showed you an example, and I have another example here. So here I'm going to create a data frame. It's just uh, this. It's the first uh, column is 1, 2, 3, 4. The second column is 1, 2, N, A, 4. And the third column is 1, 2, N, A, N, A. And I, if I hit, if I call is dot N, A, you'll see it says, it gives me true, 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 three trues for these three N, A's. So it, it does exactly that, and it keeps the shape. Now, if I look at the sum of is dot N, A, it gives me three, because there were three trues. Now, if I look at complete case dot cases of the data frame comma, that says, give me the indices of the rows that had no NAs. We saw that's rows one and two. And in fact, it just produces rows one and two. So that's what complete cases does. Now, if I say, if I take my data frame and I say, I want my is dot NA of the data frame, so that's going to give me an index of all the locations where I had an NA, and so now make them 10. And here we go. Here we have 10, 10, and 10. So you can use is.na to replace it with anything. It doesn't have to be zero. It doesn't have to be the mean. It can be whatever you want. But it is a very nice trick for if you know what you want to do with your NAs for how to handle them all at once. All right, now we're going to come to um, the last section. And what I was saying about that Boolean algebra is SQL holds uh, in spades for group data. It's just a question if you want to use it, if you use it a few times, the more times you use it, the more familiar it'll seem, and the better it'll be. So frequently one wants not a, a subset of the data, but you have subsets of the data with a characteristic, and you want to squish all of them with that characteristic into one line. And that's grouping of data. So for example, rather than looking at the data by every flight, you might just be interested in monthly information. You say, I really don't care what day of the month it was. I just want to know the information for January and the information for February. So um, 
that would be you wanted to group the dates in that fight, fight data set by month into 12 rows. Another example is you have a set of all transactions. You may say, look, I really don't care about every individual transaction. I really just care about transactions per customer. I want to take all the transactions by a customer, whether it's one, five, 20, or 100, and group them all as just one row. So for every customer, I'm going to have one row with summary information about what he did. So uh, the idea of group data is you want to create statistics per group. So you could have average delay per flight by the month. You could have the number of transactions per customer, as I said. Or you could have the average or the total amount, the dollar amount of transactions. All this stuff is example of grouping data. And um, so the key, there's two key commands. The first one is summarize. Summarize says, take what I'm telling you and just give me the information. So for example, if I have summarize flights, mean of departure delays, it's going to summarize my flight data frame by just giving the mean of the departure delay. And notice I have to use NA.RM as two, otherwise I would wind up with um, just NA. So when I do this, I, I just have all the flights, I'm asking for this thing, and I'm just going to, it really is a one by one tibble, it's just going to tell me that on average the departure delay was 12.63 da 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 minutes. Now, oops, sorry. Now, you could accomplish something that simple by just using the mean function. I could say, give me the mean of the flight's departure delay. So these are the exact same thing. But it's more powerful when you use this group by, when, which I said takes collapses a number of rows that have a certain common characteristic into one row. And so then, you know, like, so if you had all the customers in store one and you had 100 stores, you wanted to have data by you know, by store, you say you could group by, uh, you know, store, and then have all the customers in the store as one line. Well, you can now then have, you know, for each line of all the store, the tens of thousands of customer data, but you could have the mean or the median or the standard deviation. So you could have the average size of the customer transaction. You could have the total number of customer transactions by store. So I will show you this. Uh, Group by creates a new data frame with one row for each group you're using, and you instantiate it. Well, one way to instant the only way we will talk about instantiating it, by which I mean actually creating it, is to use the summarize, which says what data you want about the group, each group, each new line. So by month, if I group by flights and month, it says I want to look at all the flights, but all the flights in one month should be one row. Okay, so. All I've done is I've said group by. And since I haven't done anything, it still has the same number of rows. Okay? There should be only 12 rows, one for each month. But because I haven't done anything, just said group by, it doesn't do anything. Now, I say my by month is I want to summarize by month. So for every month, I want to know the average delay and the average distance of a flight. So the average delay, I calculate it's the mean of the departure delay. And now it's an average delay because I couldn't, you know, for one month, there's, you know, for every month, there's 30 to 50,000 flights. So I can't, you know, have a one row with month one and then 30,000 <laughs> rows for that thing. I can only have one row for the departure delay. So in this case, I just take the mean. And now when I count dimension by month, it's 12 by 3. I now have three columns. What? The, the month, the average delay, and the average distance. And again, this is in, in, in R with dplyr, this is essentially instantaneous, but you see I've taken the 350,000 rows of data and collapsed it down to 12 rows. And for each month, each one of the 12 rows, I could tell you what the average delay was, which was about, you know, range between five minutes and 10 minutes. And this might be interesting data to you. I, I think it's kind of interesting that the fall are the least delays. And, um, and the average distance of the flights in that month. So that's an example of group by. Now, this is explained and all this is worked out in chapter three of the book. If you bought the book or if you look at it online, in addition to this lecture, uh, you, you can find the information there. Uh, one new function that we haven't seen is um, count. And it's not, it's not, that, it's not written that way. Um, the count function is written by NO colon. So just so we're clear, when you're using uh, when you're using 
it's this function in the context of dplyr. That's the name of the function. And it, you see it's a function in the dplyr package and it counts the number of observations in a group. So this will give you counts. So if I, I again, and because group by and summarize changes things, every time you redo it, you have to start all over again. So I'm going to restart by, I want to group by my flights by month. And then I want to summarize them by the average delay, the average addition, and how many flights. Okay. So now I'm going to get a fourth column. And I only printed hen. I have the month, the average delay, the average distance, and now I have a count of how many flights there were in each month. So I can see in the first six months of the year there were between 27 and 28,000 flights roughly. So this is very useful. Whenever you want to count how many things are in a complicated situation, this is going to be much easier than using logical indexing or something. And I, I just want to emphasize again, since I wrote it, you know, per se wrong up there, is that's the count function, n of. Pipes. Hadley Wickham is a huge proponent of pipes. I don't like pipes, pipe, because I don't think they make codable pipe, and I think it makes it harder to initiate complicated logic pipe, and it works like a run-on sentence pipe, which I also think makes it harder to debug. So piping is a way, and you'll have to read it about it in the book or online. I mean, it's they're very popular with some people, and you'll see them when you look at our code online, you'll see a lot of it. A lot of people like to use pipes. I don't and I won't, but it's a way of making compound uh, commands in one line. I personally always think that putting the same thing on many lines, I'm just looking for a good example of this. See, so what he would do in a situation like this is rather than saying data is mutate that and then as a data frame, he would use a pipe to put this on one line. I, I don't think it, I, I really think it makes much more sense to um, just keep the data frame, keep the same name as you do new things to it and um, do a separate line. It makes it much easier to read. Okay. Uh, home stretch, I just want to give you an example of using ggplot and dplyr to take a look at things. So let's say somebody said to you, give me one of the five largest airlines by the number of flights. And I want each airline every month the statistics of the number of flights and their average delay. I'd also like to know what their longest and shortest flight was. I want to see what their uh, longest delay was. I'd like some sort of plot of the information. And you go, okie dokie, boss. And he says, are you going to use Tableau? And you say, uh, I don't think so. I'll come back to you on that. But in fact, you're just going to use ggplot and dplyr. So to find the five largest airlines, and, and this is an example of using the logic, and this is SQL, but it, you know, it's just so nice and easy. Uh, so we have to, to find the five largest airlines, we have to group by carrier, count flights, sort by the count so we can get the, the ones that are the highest on top, and then filter out all by the top five. So how do we do that? Okay, so this is an example. He would do this as a pipe with uh, these pipe signs to say, first do this, then do this, then do this. I think it's much easier to put, just you know, keep the same data frame name or change it, C, C1, C2, whatever you want. And this way you can see uh, what's going on. And in particular, if, if something goes wrong, it makes it much easier to debug it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to group my flights by carrier. Now remember, that doesn't do anything except tell R that I want to group them. How do I want to group? Well, I want to summarize it by the number of flights. And if I just count, use the count function, n of uh, colon, and I'm just going to call it num flights, it's going to count for each carrier how many flights. And here we can see. And then finally, oops, sorry, I'm going to arrange this new data set that has the flights and the, uh, the carrier and the number of flights in descending order. That means from top to bottom. That means the top five rows are going to be the top five things. And when I do it, you see, I see these airlines. UA had was the biggest. It had 58,665. B6, whatever that is, is 54,635, dot, dot, dot. Up to American Airlines is the fifth largest with 32,729 flights. Out of New York City airports in the year 2013. I'm making no 
and, and it's worth noting that um, American Airlines does not have a hub in <laughs> New York. So, okay, but you see how that, I did that? I said, all right, I want to find the five largest carriers. I group by carrier. I summarize each carrier by how many flights they did, and then I arrange it so the large the carriers with the largest number of flights were on top, and there we can read it. All right, everyone with me? Not hammer time, coffee time. Okay. So, I want the top five carriers. So I say top carriers. Remember my data set was called C. So I take C, uh, this is, you know, I, it understands the dollar sign notation. I could have used select, but I'm, for something like this is simpler. C dollar sign carriers says so give me the carriers, and I want the first five of them. So those are the top carriers. Now, I want to filter my flights data for the carrier in top carriers. This means top flights is going to be a data set of all the flights, but only the carriers that were in the top five carriers, the carriers that are in top carrier. Okay? So now I've gotten just the carriers I want. I group by carrier and month. Now, of course, the carrier is only going to be five. This says it's going to be five rows. But then when I group by month, each carrier each month has a row, so I'm actually going to have 60 rows. 12, well, presumably I'll have 60 rows, 12 rows for each carrier. So this produces a list of by carrier per month. And then what information do I want from that? I want the number of flights and the average delay. Okay? And see what it does. It does create 60 things. So I have 12 for AA, in fact, and then... But for each, now, for American, it shows for each carrier, for each month, how many flights and what the average delay is. Interesting, notice how they're all over the place. Okay? So there. That's how you get, by carrier, by month, how many flights they did and what their average delay was. So if you want to see what their longest flight and the shortest flight was per year, I'm just doing that to make it easier, I filter flights. I want the carrier and top carriers. I just want to pull out those five carriers. And then I want to group by carrier. That's going to produce a list by carrier and so for all year long. And what information do I want? I want the longest, the shortest, and the worst delay. So the longest is going to be the max of distance. The shortest is going to be the min of distance. And the worst delay is going to be um, the max of arrival dot delay. Now again, for this case, I can. There are NAs, and I had to put in NA.RM equals true to say if it, if you don't have information, we we don't know what it is. But this will compute per carrier their longest flight, their shortest flight, and their worst delay all year. And so we can see uh, the longest flight for American Airlines was 2,500 miles. The shortest flight was 187 miles, and they had a pretty bad delay. Uh, I think that's 1,007 minutes. That would have been an ugly flight. Now, by contrast, United uh, had the um, <clears throat> the longest flight was over about twice as long as Americans. The shortest was shorter, and their worst delay was half the time. So, basis this: if I'm flying out of New York and I have a choice of United or American, I'm taking United. But you see how easy it was to do this once you. Once you understand the logic of group by and summarize. Now, I'm not claiming you're going to walk out of here this class today and I got it. This is something that's going to require some work on your part. Should you decide you need to understand these things, the only way to get them is to do examples yourself. So when you've got a project where you need to sort by, it would be helpful to get an assignment to test out these concepts. I will be glad to produce, uh, uh, the book has homework, I'll be glad to give you some homework out of that. I will post it after the class, or I'll send it to Manish. We're almost done here. So let's take a look, let's just do one bar plot to, you know, do this. Uh, let's do the number of flights per month and the average delay. So I want to, you know, if in fact it is installed because I, tidyverse, but library ggplot is always a good thing. So I'm going to filter the flights by carrier and top carrier. So I'm just going to look at the top five. 
I'm going to group by carrier month. So now I'm going to have my 60 row odd, 60 rows of carrier month. And I'm going to summarize. I just want the number of flights and the average delay. And so now I want to create a graph. So I'm telling ggplot my data is this top flights. And I want a histogram. And I just want the number of flights and the fill as carrier. Now, what does this mean? I'm just going to get a histogram of the number of flights. Uh, and the fill as carrier will allow me to see by carrier. So look what this shows. It shows you something very interesting that was hinted at. So what does this show? It said, you know, that it had a, uh, now, it's a stat that been using bins equal 30, pick a better value. You probably, if you were doing this to show your boss who's interested in airlines, you'd probably want to have this rather than just being the actual number of flights. You'd want to group them by, you know, um, uh, 500, 1,000, you know, something reasonable rather than by 30s. But you can see here's 1, 3, and 3 is 6, and 4 is 10, and 2 is 12. So here's 12 months of data, and you can see, you know, there was one time when it had this very one month in which it had little flights. Most of the time, it had flights. Excuse me. Uh, it had looks like about 2,500 flights per month. And notice this shows what we saw. United Airlines, remember, had the most flights, and we can see the data for United is is all the way over on the right. And basis this B6 had the second most flights. You see anything to the right is saying a month with that many flights. So th this would say there were four months in which it had about this many flights. Okay. Okay. Conclusion. I've explained read.csv and freed. Check. I can't say I did it well, but I can say I've done it. I've explained filter, select, mutate, and Boolean commands. And I think I've shown you that this is what SQL does. So you sort of know SQL. And as I've said, the devil's in the details, which is say, um, I don't think these things are hard in the sense of they're in, that I think most people can master this. It's just a question of practice. It's the old joke. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Okay, so you've heard some of my likes and dislikes about the tidyverse. I'm very high on deep wire. I don't like pipes. You're free, absolutely free to disagree, as my friend Jerry Siegel used to always say. That's why they make chocolate and vanilla. I've introduced you to group by and summarize. And as I've said over and over again, the only way to get good at these things is by doing them a lot. Finally, if you decide that you like the syntax of data.table, there's lots of information of that available on the web. And as I said, um, the book, R for Data Science, uses this New York City flights as in chapter three in the whole package. But if you look over here, which is a vignette for data table, I believe that site that will lead you to a, a, a location where you can they work out um, the same details for New York City flights using data dot table. You can actually see. Yep. It gives you basic information and it does use the flights. But you can definitely find that. All right, are there any questions? In that case, I'm going to uh, first, oops, I'm going to turn off the recording and I'm going to turn off my webcam.